Jessica Rowe, from, uh, she is an ecologist from the Center of uh, Ecology and Hydrology uh, in UK. So most welcome to Göteborg and Sweden. And the title of your talk is The Impact of Bioenergy System on Soil Carbon. Yeah, so yeah I come from Lancaster in the UK, which is one of the wettest cities, so I'm used to the grey. It's fine. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the wins and outs of uh, bioenergy crops and soil carbon. So I originally started as an ecologist, but since 2011, I've been working on soil carbon. So I now pretend to be a soil carbon stock and, uh, person. But um, So what I'm looking at is two projects I've been working on. So one was on the impact of soil carbon stocks of converting to, so land use change, to the perennial biocrops Willow and Miscanthus. That's the Elam project starting in 2011 to 2015. Following that, I looked on the Magloo project of the impacts of soil carbon stocks of perennial crop removal, so taking it back out again, um, and that's been 2015, 2018. Both of these are large consortiums. The soil carbon stock assessments that I've been involved in was a small part of them. There's lots of modelling work, lots of economic assessments um, that other people have been involved in. They're great projects if you want to have a whole range. The Elam project was funded by the Energy Technology Institute, the Magloo project was Supergen, Bioenergy Hub, which I'm now a member of. So I'm now the topic representative for the resource part of the Supergen Bioenergy Hub. So I can answer questions on that as well. Um, the reason we look at these two crops, so these Willow SLC and Miscanthus, is in the UK, at the moment we have around 10,000 hectares of both of these crops. But the Committee on Climate Change, which is what Patricia was talking about earlier, have recommended that we increase this or have predicted that in order to meet our zero carbon targets, we're looking to increase this to something around 0.7 to 1 million hectares by 2030 within the UK. So that's about 7% of agricultural land. That's a massive land use change. And we need to understand the full economic or the full environmental impacts of doing that. Um, I'm going to do the Elam quite quickly. I've published this work, and there's quite a lot of work on the impacts of land use change to these crops. So, um, realistically, so this is what we did. We went out around the country. Um, we sampled 20 Miscanthus sites and 21 SLC Willow sites. These are commercial scale fields. We sampled the field along with an additional field next door that was the original land use, so I have an arable field or a grass and field, and we basically worked out the soil carbon stock change by taking one off the other. And that's what I've got along here. So this is a percentage change in soil carbon stock, and this is against the reference soil carbon stock. So that original green for grassland, red for arable. And what we found is in the surface soil, so that's in the 0 to 30 centimetre, based on the current soil mass, uh, was negatively correlated with that reference soil carbon stock. That basically means if you plant your bioenergy crop, your willow, on a low carbon soil, so in this case below 60 tonnes per hectare, you're going to get an increase in soil carbon stock, you're most likely to. If you plant it on a high soil carbon stock, you're more likely to have a small loss. The miscanthus line is under, that's because most of our miscanthus sites were quite young. The le length of time you put a crop in the ground for, soil carbon stocks take a long time to change. It's likely that our work and the modelling work that goes along with this suggests that that would probably be a very similar response to the willow at a longer time. The willow sites were just older, they're in the ground longer. We find no impact over the deeper one metre. That's because soil carbon stocks have a one metre very large, so you're, you're getting quite a small stock change in the total, so it's quite hard to pick up. We take less calls at a metre in this project. Um, so that's really a summary. Basically, plant on low carbon soil, you like to find an increase. Overall, if you're doing a full life cycle assessment of these crops, generally you're okay with your offsetting in terms of your total impact on your emissions, but that's somebody else's work, so I'll let you read their paper. Um, so the other stuff I've been doing is the other side, so this is more my recent work, so this is the impact of taking the crop out of the ground. All of these crops, so willow miscanthus, miscanthus has a lifespan of around 15 years, willow 20, 25 years when you're constantly harvesting, leaving the crop in the ground. At some point, they have to come out or they have to get replanted. We want to know what the impact of doing that was on the soil carbon stock. Hence the Magaloo project. Slightly different. Reversion is very unusual in the UK because we haven't had the crops very long. Very few of them being reverted. So I went and tried to find every farmer I could who'd taken a crop out of the ground. I've only got Miscanthus, I've got two sites that met my criteria. SLC Willow, another two sites. I've also got a tillage site, which I'll explain at the end. 
Um, again, commercial field sites, paired approach, so sample the willow or the miscanthus, sample an additional site that's exactly the same soil type, as close as possible to a match, take one off the other. We took more meter course, we went down to a meter, this is our meter sampling kit, it's great, you get to hammer stuff into the ground. Um, and we also take a whole load of surface soil stocks because that's easier to do. Um, we do this on equivalent soil mass. Don't need to worry about it unless you're a soil scientist. Basically accounts for difference in bulk density. If you're an LCA person though and you're using soil carbon stock data, this is now the standard. So if you're looking at papers and they're not using equivalent soil mass, you need to think about what that might mean for your numbers. So ideally, when I say I'd have a paired site, I would have a bioenergy crop over here, my miscanthus. I would have an arable control and my removed site. Unfortunately, I couldn't find all of those. What I have got is the SRC sites, that's the willow. All of the bioenergy crop generally have been removed. It all got old. The farm had taken the whole lot out. So I was only left with arable controls. I've got one miscanthus site that's got an arable. This is the site with all three. The other miscanthus site I had, he'd planted all of his land with miscanthus. He'd taken some of it out. He left some of it in, but he didn't have any arable fields on the same soil type that I can compare to. So I've only got a miscanthus control. So going to the results of this. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to go through these in summary. So basically, this is our arable controls, and these are our bioenergy controls, so comparing to miscanthus in this case. Um, so in case of these, what we generally find is quite a mixed result. Now, I've got a few sites. So soil carbon stocks are notoriously variable. So I'm not surprised that I've got very mixed results, and we're going to do a lot more research before we can make strong conclusions. What I'm finding, though, is in one of my sites, my miscanthus, so this had been taken out three years previously for me doing the sampling. And here I've got a loss in soil carbon stock compared to my arable. In case of this site, I've actually got an increase, but what's weird is that this is minus three years and this is minus six years. I've got more soil carbon in the site that's been taken out the longest. Speaking to the farmer in detail, he's managing these fields where he's taken out the willow in an attempt to increase his soil carbon stock because he's heard that's going to be a good idea for his uh, funding in the future. So he's deliberately, he, he's, he's using me to check his results. So this suggests that there's actually ways, it's not just about the bioenergy crop, it's how you manage the crop afterwards that's going to be critically important as well. This site had no significant difference. This is the meter data. 30 centimeter data, the pattern's very similar. Apart from in this site, you do get a slight significant increase in the surface soil carbon socks. In the miscanthus site, I haven't got an arable control, so you're only comparing to the bioenergy crop, and I'd expect the bioenergy crop to be slightly higher. And I do find a slight decrease in that soil carbon stock of the process of removing the crop. It's quite intensive, there's lots of ploughing. We know that ploughing and soil disturbance causes soil carb can cause soil carbon stock reduction. So in both these sites, they've got, again, site Willow and Miscanthus taken out different years, so in minus three years and minus four years, again, a slight decrease, and again in this one, and again in this Nottingham site again. So I am getting a loss in soil carbon stock compared to the bioenergy crop, which does mean you've got to think about whether or not you're crediting yourself for that soil carbon storage underneath your bioenergy crop in the long term. Um, as the losses are really probably the bit we're worried about, so obviously in this one, we've actually got uh, something like a massive 50 to 70 tonne gain, but in one site we've got a loss, so I had a quick look at what that might mean in terms of our, our life cycle balance. So that change was a minus 30 tonnes of carbon per hectare. I have back calculated some LCA data for energy production. In the UK, we're mainly burning these crops um, for conversion. So depending on whose LCA you will use, I've used the standard 15-year life cycle and a 10, uh, 11 tonne per hectare yield. I'm getting a carbon offset, so that's the credit you get for offsetting your fossil fuel, uh, between 35 and 137 uh, um, tons or megagrams of um, carbon per hectare. So this number is wiping out, could wipe out a considerable portion or a portion of your offset. The issue is, I don't know how long this decrease is going to last for, because in theory, when we do lots of modeling of soil carbon, Changes in soil carbon, if you continue to, mo me to manage this field in the same way as the adjacent arable field, I'd expect the soil carbon in the miscanthus field to return to the same level as the arable field over time. The issue is, it's for a period of time, we're releasing CO2 to the atmosphere, and it's how long we're going to then take to get that back, back out again. So it's a temporal release. I'm not suggesting this loss is going to be permanent, because soil carbon stocks are wholly dependent on your long-term management. There is another option, though, to removing miscanthus, which is where we come to the tillage. 
So in this case, or disking. So farmers in the UK who had their miscanthus planted very early on when we adopted it have got very clumpy sites. And because of this, they're getting reductions in yields in very patchy sites, which also happens when the crop gets older. The rhizome, they're like a potato, gets very clumped together, and it means it reduces the yield. So what they're looking at doing is disking. So these are just metal discs they pull behind the tractor, run through the crop to chop up the rhizome, and then they roll it back in again. If any of you garden, it's the same as digging up a plant and dividing it to make it grow better. Exactly the same theory. Um, this is a stock photo, not one of mine. Um, so we had this done. Now, unfortunately for some of my colleagues, we have a long-term monitoring site in a commercial bioenergy crop in Lincolnshire in the UK. This farmer planted two fields in 2006, one with Scampus here and one here. This one at the top is one we've had a long-term monitoring site. We had lots of lovely experiments in it, including an Eddie Turks flower tower since it's been in. And in 2013, he dissed it. So he went through all of our samples. Um, <laughs> so there were small areas. So a lot of my colleagues and my friends in my office lost their experiments, but I saw a huge gain. So in 2016, I sampled this site as part of the Elam project to look at what the impact would be of the tillage. So I've compared this dissed field to this non disc field adjacent. Plant at the same time, same tour type, perfect experiment for me. Um, and what we did is we then, luckily as well, I also sampled his site as part of the Elam project in 2011. So I also had archived soil samples from this field and this adjacent arable field. And when I resampled this field, I used the same sampling locations. So I've got a direct comparison from the earlier sampling, which is very good for me, not so good for my colleagues. So what we found, so this is a depth profile, so I thought I'd put one in as a soil scientist because we like these. So this is our soil mass going down this side, so basically the deeper, it, the more mass you get, the deeper I'm going down in the sampling. I sample every 10 centimetres and that dividing the core up. Um, across the bottom is my tonnes of carbon per hectare, so it's, a cu it's um, cumulative. So as you go down, you're getting an increase in the soil carbon stock. The tilled site or the disc site is in green and the post-tilled one is in red, and I find absolutely no difference in the soil carbon stock between either of those all the way down the depth profile. I would l this is a kind of graph that soil scientists we dream of, because normally our sites are very variable. So I get really good overlap. So I'm quite convinced this soil, this, in this case, in this field, the disking had no effect on the overall soil carbon stock. So compared to removal, where I am potentially going to risk a loss, in this case, I'm having none of that. I can also compare the surface soil data. We took more meter deep sampling in this year than we did in the Elam project. So I can only compare the 15 centimeter data, sorry, the 30 centimeter data. Ooh. So in this case, what I find is, so these are my two, my distant, non-dist field, where I have no difference in my soil carbon stock. But if we look back, so I actually then now have a say, similar carbon stock to my 2000 arable field. But what's also more interesting is actually compared to my 2011 miscanthus sampling, I'm getting an increase in soil carbon stock in both of the fields. And that just reaffirms what I was saying about it takes time for soil carbon stocks to increase. So in the Elam project, this site is one of those sites that's below the line. If I was to re-put this data in, it would then be above the line in terms of a change in carbon over time. So the longer the crops in the ground, the more likely you are to have a beneficial effect on your soil carbon stock. And that comes from my summary nicely. So in terms of this ins and outs, so the in bit, so planting bioenergy crops on a low carbon soil maximizes your, and uh, maximizing the lifespan of the crop are the two things that most like to get your uh, increase in carbon storage. I use storage, not sequestration carefully. Um, and that's not guaranteed, but that's your best chance. In terms of the outs, so soil carbon stocks um, can be impacted by crop removal, um, but the overall balance will depend on the life cycle of the crop, and that's the whole life cycle. That's not just your offsetting, that's how you manage a crop after you've removed it and how you're going to manage your soil carbon stock thing. In regards to soil carbon conservation, the option of disking or tillage or regenerative tillage is what the company like to call it. Um, this may offer a better option than removing and replanting. And that regenerative tillage is being used a little bit more in the UK more recently. What I need to do next, or what I need some help doing next, is really look at the scenario. I need some scenario-based temporal landscape scale modeling to predict the long-term impacts of this in and out carbon uh, changes in regional soil carbon stock storage of bioenergy crop rotation. So 
Yes, crops are going to be coming in and out on a field-by-field -field basis, and maybe it'll be negative for that field. But at the same time, it's likely to be planted somewhere else. And if we're increasing the total stock in the UK, we need to understand how that whole dynamic plays out, rather than doing a by-field assessment. So I might lose soil carbon stock in field A, but am I gaining enough in field B to offset it? We've got to stop doing this. This field did this, and that field did that. I think we need this more scenario modelling. Um, and I'm open for any questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Very interesting. Um, were you surprised of the results? Uh, 